Ulster Scots people. Uh, it started in the north, it started with the Boston Tea Party and all those sort of things, but the real battles were fought elsewhere and um, Washington, George Washington, at a point when he thought the whole war was over, when he thought he was going to be defeated, he said that if he was defeated everywhere else, his last stand would be among the Scotch Irish of his native Virginia, because he knew that the Scotch Irish of his native Virginia had formed the bulk of his forces, and there was one of the, the regiments, the famous Pennsylvania line, was, was crammed full of Ulster men and Ulster commanders. Um, the uh, in the southern states, the, the, plan, the uh, plan by the British authorities at that time was to capture states in the south to try and encourage people to, to come out and support the king, form militia in support of the king, and then to capture George Washington, because the, the troops were in the north as well, to capture him in a pincer between the two and to win America back again. And they did capture the state of Georgia, and they moved into South Carolina. Um, they... The commander there was a man called Patrick Ferguson, who was from Aberdeenshire in Scotland. And he uh, issued a threat because he, he knew that in the mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains, these people were arming, they were forming militia. Uh, he believed the Presbyterian churches were preaching sedition against the king um, and were forming uh, militia against the, the troops. And so he issued a threat. Now, we're not sure exactly what he said. But he, he certainly threatened that he was going to lay the land waste, he was going to burn the crops, he was going to burn down houses and churches, uh, Presbyterian churches. The terminology he used was such that these the people who heard this and responded readily to it were uh, Covenanter Presbyterians. And they were located in the up, what's called the upstate of South Carolina and into North Carolina and Tennessee. And they were very um, fervently religious people, and they regarded Ferguson as having blasphemed in some of the words that he had used. So they decided that he wouldn't need to come to them, they would certainly go to meet him, and they would punish him for his actions and all the rest of it. So they gathered up at a place called Sycamore Shoals in Tennessee, and they gathered up what are called the Over Mountain Men um, from that whole area. And that, that area of the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, uh, there was a term given to these people from, particularly from the north of Ireland, these Protestant settlers, and they were referred to as King Billy's men um, from the mountains because they supposedly they had tunes like the boy in water that they played and all the rest of it. Um, when I was over in the state of Georgia some years ago, I met a, a folk singer from North Carolina, and his family were he, he was Gilbert, and his ancestors were Gilberts from Northern Ireland. And we talked about what the folk culture might have passed down, what songs and tales might have come down from these people. And he said there's a, there was a tune in his family that came down from the settlers, and he didn't know anything about it, didn't know the name of it, didn't know anything to do with it, but he played the tune, um, and the tune he played on his guitar that day was a tune called Lily Bolero, which was the Williamite March, of course, that the troops marched to. Um, now, he had no knowledge of that at all, but that had come down from one generation to the next. So it, it, it highlights the fact that they did have this tradition, um, they did have this orange musical tradition and all the rest of it. Um, that term, King Billy's Men from the Mountains, is better known today by a, a description of a type of music, Hillbilly music, uh, because King Billy's Men from the Hills became shortened to Hillbilly, or Hillbillies. And, um, well, we all know about the Beverly Hillbillies. And there's a few Hillbillies around here too, I imagine. I don't really know them very well. Uh, but that's where the term comes from. Now, the other thing that happened at Sycamore Shoals suggests to us that there's more to this than music. <clears throat> After the Battle of the Boyne, there were a number of organisations formed, a number of groups formed to help commemorate the Boyne and to commemorate William of Orange and so on. One of them was called the Boyne Societies, and the Boyne Societies would have been the most extensive organisation. And it's on the same model, essentially, as uh, the Orange, Orange Lodges would be today other than the fact that there was no overall overarching organisation to it like there would be a Grand Lodge of Ireland today. At Sycamore Shoals in Tennessee, when these men gathered, a Presbyterian minister whose roots lay in the Six Mile Water Valley of County Alderman called Samuel Doak, he got up, he was quite uh, well on in years at that time, he got up and he delivered a very fiery sermon. And it's, it's very unusual for clerics from Northern Ireland to be fiery, as we know, or to deliver fairy sermons, but this man did deliver a fairy sermon. I was just being funny there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and in the fairy sermon, as he came to the end of it, and the words are repeated in American texts, and there are certain words repeated in bold, 
which suggests that he emphasized them or he shouted them. And Doak, at the end of it all, he told them to go out by the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Uh, and those words would be familiar to Orange Lodges today. But there were no Orange Lodges in 1780. Um, but we believe it's connected to the Boyne Societies because the connection with the Boyne Societies comes down into the Orange as well. So that's how we, we know about it and recognize it. When Doak uh, made that exclamation, there was loud cheering from the men around him and so on. And he got so carried away, he nearly went with them. Uh, but they had to restrain him and, and tell him he needed to stay at home with the women and the children and the elderly people um, and look after them. They still reenact this. We're not the only people that march, you know. And uh, the Appalachian Mountains, they still march the Over Mountain Trail down to Kings Mountain where the battle took place. And it takes them two weeks to do it. Some people think we're bad in Northern Ireland, half a day's march and close down the towns and everything else. It takes them two weeks to do this. Um, and they, they went down... In 1780, they went to King's Mountain, uh, which was where Ferguson decided to take a stand. It looked like the castle at the Rock of Edinburgh. He thought it was a good sign, but it wasn't a very good sign. And when he met the Over Mountain men, he met men from Ballymena and Ballymoney, first generation settlers, a lot of them, into that up country area. And uh, his force was completely defeated at that battle. And it was followed by another battle then, the Battle of Hannes Cowpens, um, which took place in 1781. Hannes Cowpens was portrayed on the film, the Mel Gibson film, The Patriot, if anybody has seen it. That's, essentially, that's talking about the Battle of Hannes Cowpens. It's not giving you a big flavour of the Ulster men that fought at Hannes Cowpens or helped to win that battle, but that's what happened. Um, Hannes Cowpens was fought in the winter, January 1781. The night before the battle, there was such a severe frost, some of the soldiers woke up the next morning, they were lying on the ground, and their hair had frozen to the ground. That was the type of frost it was. And these were very, very hardy people um, to withstand that. And then the next day they won that battle. And they fought under the command of General Daniel Morgan, who was from Draperstown in County Londonderry. And they defeated uh, the forces that were there against them. And those two battles effectively sealed the fate of King George in America. Because they realised they couldn't win. They couldn't take the south. And taking the south was the most important part of the plan. Uh, and because it couldn't be captured, these over mountain men could down a squirrel at goodness knows how many yards. You couldn't fight with them. You couldn't fight a guerrilla warfare with these men. And the other thing was that one of one of the authors in later years about all of this said he referred to one of the quotes that they gave, and they said that they were they were beaten, fell down, got up again, fought again. They might have been beaten, but they were still going to go back up again. A man called um, Jack Buchanan. He gave an account uh, in more recent years. He's an Ulster Scott historian from New York. And he said that um, in the heat of battle, these were the people who might bend but would never break. Um, and that was his tribute to the Ulster Scots, the Scotch-Irish that took part in the revolution. So it's no exaggeration to say they helped in a major way to win the revolution. In fact, I would say they helped win the revolution without saying in a major way. I think they won it um, because of their tenacity and because they, they were fired up because they believed um, that they'd been persecuted. There was a massacre that took place at the Waxhaw, which is where Andrew Jackson grew up. And um, after the massacre, the local Presbyterian minister got up and he gave a sermon and he said that uh, they had been forced out of Scotland, from the, the hills of Scotland as Covenanters. They'd been forced out of Ulster by the authorities. And he said, where are you going to run to now? And they didn't run anywhere. They burned a militia that next day and they went to do battle. Um, and that was the, the, the metal of the people that um, the, uh, King George had decided to take on in America. He decided to take on uh, Ulster Scots people, who were referred to in one famous, I think it was Horace Walpole, said that um, the American Revolution was nothing more or less than our American cousin running off with a Presbyterian parson. Um, and that highlighted the connection they believed there was. The Presbyterian church were referred to as sedition shops, a number of them were burnt. The Waxhaw one was burnt. Another one, an Indian town formed by the Witherspoons, was burnt um, by the troops going through uh, because they believed the ministers were preaching sedition. 